Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's an absolute honor here uh, to stay, share the stage with Dr. Westman. Uh, he's an icon in this field. He started this when it was not fashionable. Uh, and, you know, it's, he knows more about this area than I think anybody else does. At least has more clinical experience than anybody else does. I enjoyed Nurse Cindy. We are also uh, graced by the presence of Amy Berger. I don't know if you know her or not, but she is just absolutely amazing. I'm her Twitter follower. She's got great YouTube videos on uh, ketogenic diet and Alzheimer's. And um, I got up here. I, I'm an Indian. I get very passionate. I speak fast. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to uh, slow down, but. Um, before going, I wanted to recognize that there are a lot of people here from Clear Lake. Uh, my team, which is Melissa, she runs Eat Mostly Fats uh, Facebook group. Uh, there's Georgie out here who is recording. And uh, there is a large number of people that I know out here. Uh, David and Ron and Sharon and Maurice and Sarah. These are all people I have learned from. So I think that this is a large uh, Clear Lake crowd. Uh, a little shout out from you guys. <laughs> so I, I prepared long and hard and uh, you guys heard that um, you should follow a high diet and if you go to any cardiologist they will say that this is going to kill you. And I'm going to try to do my best to dispel some of this myth. Um, because there is a paradox. Uh, when you, uh, this is not my pointer. I guess my pointer is in my pocket or? Hmm? No, this is one. Thank you, Dr. This is Nurse Cindy's pointer. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, so uh, there is a paradox between insulin resistance and LDL because everything you do to reduce insulin levels is probably going to increase your LDL. So you're going to be scared about it. So what is insulin resistance? This is a young man, he is thin and uh, when you check his blood sugar levels early in the morning it will be about 90, that's normal. And if you check his fasting insulin levels, they'll be somewhat low at about if he's following a low carb diet. So putting these two together and putting it, putting it into an equation, you can get what is called HOMA IR, model of insulin resistance, and anything less than one is considered to be good. On the other hand, about 70 to 80 percent of obese people uh, would behave like this. What I get from many people is saying that, Doc, my blood sugar is just a little bit up. I mean, it's a little over 100 and I'm really being... Yeah, that is the history of diabetes because your body tries to maintain your blood sugar. So you, I never want to diagnose anybody diabetic based on their blood sugars alone. Need along with the blood sugar is a simultaneous insulin level. And in many people who are overweight, it is high, and in his case, it's about 20. And when you plug that into the equation, you find that this is 5.43, and that is considered severe insulin resistance. So you are maintaining the sugars at this level at the cost of very high insulin levels. And do those insulin levels harm you? And are we getting to this uh, stage of insulin resistance? And clearly that's because of the way we eat uh, whole grain bread, a truckload of sugar, um, Crisco which is corn oil or uh, vegetable oils and vegetable oils are one of the most inflammatory aspects of the American diet and uh, they are not like saturated fat like animal fat which is very different for us. And 
pointed out that sugary fruit can also so if you look at the calories, about 66% of our calories com are coming from this trifecta of added sugar, grains, and plant oils. And is leading to insulin resistance. If I were to ask three people to stand up in this room, two of them will be overweight or obese. And similarly, if I were to do insulin resistance evaluation on you, about 70% of Americans will be insulin resistant. So that's tag. Why is insulin resistant bad? And you heard about it from many people. But it increases the risks of cancers because insulin is a growth factor. It releases insulin-like growth factor that gives cancer. It causes strokes. It causes polycystic ovarian syndrome. You see acne, obesity, and, uh, uh, and pain during menses. Um, we talked about diabetes as one of the end stages of insulin resistance, the way we conventionally define it. It's heart attacks, it's Alzheimer's, it's obesity, and this what we call as toxic hunger. Insulin makes you lose satiety signals. It makes you not see leptin. It makes you not see that you are full. It makes you think that you're starving all the time. So. This is strange that's happening to me here. I see. I don't have my phone on me, but something was ringing. So, when you go to a cardiologist, if you pose a, a thousand cardiologists, almost no one will tell you to eat like this. Now, I tell my patients to eat like this, which is triple cream cheese, uh, sour cream, butter, uh, cook in lard. When was the last time you heard a cardiologist say cook in lard? <laughs> Eat uh, some chicken. But why don't we behave like this? And the reason we don't behave like this is probably because of imprinting. Um, I don't know if you know about Cornad Lorenz, but he was the first guy who said that when geese are born, they look at the first moving object and they consider that as their mother. And for us, for the last 50 years, the way we are eating is because of a gentleman by the name of Ansel Keys who came on the time, a cover of Time magazine who set American nutritional guidelines right after World War II. And he along, because he was a big member of the American Heart Association, um, I know that you heard that the Dewar Foundation Fellow sponsored by the American Heart Association. So this is a little bit of a paradox for me. <laughs> but if you go to the Heart Association website, you will still see this today that Americans eat too much fat, especially most of that is saturated fat. And I'm asking you to really eat saturated fat and I'll probably give you uh, some good evidence for that. They want us to eat less than 4% saturated fat and cut down from 40% fat to about 15% fat in our diet. So that's the imprinting that we have received over the last several years. So this is one of my heroes. Many of you will see him at the low carb cruise at Andrea Seinfeld. This is how he eats. Uh, this is actually egg yolk with some butter. Chunk of meat. Uh, not a big fan of fiber. If somebody asks me that question, I will get into that. This is what happened to his blood sugar. So remained steady 90 for about six hours. Now, if you continually eat like this, I can almost predict, because this is what I've been seeing for the last four to five years, that your LDL cholesterol will go up. And we'll discuss that in a little bit. Now, he gives talks at bariatric surgery conference. There's a lady here who asked about bariatric surgery. Uh, I have special interest in that, so if you ask a question about it, I'll address it. Um, but when he went to the bariatric surgery conference, he ate grain, uh, which was supposed to be a hummus sandwich. This is low carb or non carb, or sorry, non fat yogurt. Um, he said he didn't eat the apple, he ate the Snickers bar. And this is what happened to his sugars. So clearly they are almost, they are definitely in pre-diabetic range, they are to some degree in diabetic range. And what you see at about 5 hours is that his sugar takes a little dip, 
because of all the insulin his body has had to produce and he feels hungry whereas in the other pattern of eating he was not hungry now what the medical profession doesn't tell you is that when you start eating a high carb what lipemia means is that there is fat in your blood so if you check the fat of somebody eating like this you will see that their triglycerides which is the good cholesterol goes up and their HDL cholesterol goes down so I didn't start my So the question we need to ask is that what is the evidence that saturated fat and cholesterol cause heart disease? A dye high in saturated fat will eventually increase your LDL levels. If you're metabolically quite abnormal, it may initially drop it or keep it at the same level. But the longer you follow it and the leaner you get, your LDL levels are going to go up. So, let us see what's the evidence that total cholesterol or, or LDL cholesterol cause heart disease and I can give this lecture about the lack of association or an inverse association between fat and cholesterol and heart disease for an hour but I've shortened it to a few minutes. So this is European countries, uh, Eastern Europe out here, Russia, Georgia, Azerbaijan. These are the uh, Western European countries, amongst them France has fallen off but I can kind of fill in. Um, UK, Italy. Now saturated fat intake as you go up the scale is going up and as the saturated fat intake is going up so is cholesterol going up. But here is heart disease mortality and you would have to say damn the French. You don't see them out there because they are eating roughly about 17% saturated fat and yet they have the lowest risks of dying from heart disease. And the countries that are eating less saturated fat have a much higher risk of dying from heart disease. And smoking is not an issue here because the French smoke more than anybody else. <laughs> Similarly, just to give you a pic pictorial version of this, this is the Monica Project, uh, 2008. All the countries, which is Italy, Sweden, Spain, are high fat countries because the redder they are, they are eating more fat, the Eastern European countries are eating less fat. So this is the amount of fat intake. But when you look at the death rate, you see that the death rate is actually the exact opposite. The countries that eat the most fat have the lowest death rate compared to the countries that are eating less fat. Um, this is Dr. Westman, you know, you know I'm a fan of his. Um, <laughs> This is a study he did, and I think some of these numbers may be cut off, but when you go on a very low carb diet, what he has shown is that all parameters of your health, weight, your waist circumference, your insulin levels, your HDL, your triglycerides, drop much greater than with any other nutritional change you can make. The one caveat out there, and I don't know if you can see that or no, but the, HDL, the LDL goes up just a little bit. And that is picked up by people and, 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 and chastised saying that, hey, you're losing weight, but this diet is going to kill you. <laughs> so another popular myth is that when you fast, your cholesterol levels will go down. And, and nothing can be further from the truth. Because these are a group of people, healthy people, about 10 I think, that went on a one week fast. They ate nothing for one week other than water and salt. I swear to God, I'm not doing this. <laughs> so, um, there was some stuff. Uh, but anyway, so what do you think is happening to their LDL levels? as they are fasting. Is the LDL level going to go down or go up? This must be this. I apologize. I think we are recording it in another way. I apologize. So what this is showing you is that when you stop, you know, you can have about carbs worth about one day. 
after you stop having carbs, because you cannot store carbs because since you're not eating, then you are almost dependent on burning fat. And the way the body transports fat and blood is through LDL. So in order to traffic more fat when you're fasting, you're dependent on fat calories. So in here you can see that the LDL went from 112 to 190. It was a 70% increase. Your cholesterol went up from 189 to 260. So I can almost guarantee you that if you want your cholesterols to go up, and I want people's cholesterol to go up, unlike other physicians, the best way to do it is to fast. Okay, so now let's look at, this is cholesterol, this is triglycerides, which is fat, and this is a beaker of water with oil. Our blood is like water. Fat does not dissolve in blood. So our body has to have a mechanism for carrying this fat. And the way it does that is that when, let's say you're fasting and you have run out of your carbs, the way it happens is that the liver puts out the fat in this molecule which is called the VLDL molecule. It's got a cover on the outside so that it can dissolve in blood. And it has fat, and, which is triglycerides and cholesterol inside it. So the cargo of this particle is fat and cholesterol. And the body is making this for a reason. So if you were to ask a hundred cardiologists, why does our body make LDL? And they'll come back and say, and I think 99 will come back and say it causes heart disease. So lower the LDL, the better it is. But really the reason, the primary reason the body makes an LDL, which is called the bad cholesterol, is to transport energy. It's transporting fat energy to, to dump it into the fat cells for storage or give it to the heart muscle or to the skeletal muscle to be used as energy. So once it, this particle that started out in the liver dumps all the fat energy into the fat or the heart or the muscle cells, it changes its function from becoming a delivery to that of a support function. So it's supporting the body and that is then called the LDL. So we said that the primary job of the VLDL, which changes to an LDL, is to distribute energy to the cells. So is that the only thing that it does? Now I spent a lot of time putting these slides together, but LDL is one of our primary defense mechanisms in neutralizing pathogens. It kills bacteria and viruses. So here you see, oh it didn't play. Maybe I should do this. Hmm. Click it on the oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to um, click it from there. All right, here it is. I spent so much time uh, making these slides that I think that uh, I feel cheated if it doesn't work. Well, in any case, what it was supposed to show was that um, the uh, LDL molecule is coming around and circling a, a bacteria and then subsequently making it disappear. Well, at least that worked. <laughs> so, is that the only function? No. The LDL is an important support function because every cell in the body, like Nurse Cindy said, is, has cholesterol in it. This is the cell membrane, an integral part of the cell membrane is cholesterol. So this is a membrane, cholesterol is an important part of it. And um, you mind putting the, let me just see if I can, I, I just take care of it. That's okay. Okay, I have no idea why it doesn't want to work. Um, so, in any case, I think it will save me time and give you time for questions. That's good. There's always a positive way of looking at it. But what it does is that you can see that when there is injury to the cell membrane, the LDL supplies cholesterol for repair of cells. So an important function of the LDL molecule is to help repair tissues. Now is that the only thing it does? Now I can by no means exhaust and tell you everything that the LDL does, but um, this is an important function. The LDL supplies cholesterol to the ovaries and testes. There's a huge explosion of erectile dysfunction 
and without the LDL supplying cholesterol you're not making estrogens and testosterone what about the brain what about cognitive skills uh, nurse Cindy said that cholesterol is an important part of the brain about 25 percent of the body's cholesterol resides in the brain because the cholesterol creates these lipid rafts these lipid rafts hold together the receptors for neurotransmitters so in other words if you don't have these cholesterol rafts your brain doesn't communicate with each other well and you get cognitive decline um, there is a very nice book Lipitor thief of memory because when you try to reduce cholesterol dramatically people comp complain of statin associated cognitive effects and I would encourage you to consider looking this up several of my patients come to my office and talk about cognitive decline on statins and they say they've been talking to their physicians about it and all the physicians roll their eyes and say stop looking at the internet <laughs> so here is a partial list of functions that the LDL does from energy delivery antioxidants we never got a chance to talk about CoQ10 because that causes myopathy, it carries fat soluble vitamins, it neutralizes pathogens, it helps reduce the risks of malignancy. There is a strong data that people who have been on long term statins have a higher risk of cancers. And we talked about um, cell signaling or neurotransmission and we talked already about cognitive decline. So you would find it very rare for a cardiologist to come here and talk about statins in a negative way and when I do that I take a significant amount of risk but I think that this information should come out to the public as to what statins usually are so here is an ad in the paper that says by reducing LDL cholesterol statin reduce cardiac events by 36 percent now that looks like such an amazing thing that everybody in the drinking water should have statins <laughs> now um, I gave a detailed presentation which is called lipid seminars at Clear Lake it's on YouTube and I'd like you to go and watch that if you want a detailed in-depth review of what statins are and what the risks and benefits are for people who are interested in a carnivorous diet there is a very nice uh, YouTube presentation and also something about personal fat threshold and why stomach acid is important for you I think there was a question back there about um, GERD and acid reflux so what I want to tell you is that almost all drug trials are drug company sponsored I'm doing good Georgie thanks so um, um, a company doesn't have to disclose all the studies it does it can do 10 studies and only show the favorable study now the studies are done in about 1000 centers these days in about 25 different countries and the drug company is responsible for collecting all the data through its employees the statisticians are employed by the drug company and there are something called ghost writers the, the company employs ghost writers to write the papers so that doctors can read and disseminate that information so we saw that Lipitor was causing a 36% reduction in this group of uh, patients who had high blood pressure. So this slide is from David Diamond and I'm a big fan of David Diamond. Um, and what he did was he took, this is a combined endpoint out here, you see it kind of fall off, which is um, the percentage of people not having a heart attack and not dying. So in other words, instead of showing how many people had heart attacks and dying, he said, I want to show the percent of people who were on this drug who did not have an event. And he's saying, where is the 36%? Because these two numbers are pretty close to 100. So this is the study that has been well published and it has uh, launched Lipitor. And the 36% is right here. This is group of people who are not dying and not having a heart attack. And what you see is that the actual difference is 98.1% in the treated group and 97 in the placebo group in a trial that was completely run by the drug company the difference was 1.1% and how do you make 1.1% into 36% so 
If you look at the fine print out here, which is in blue background with a blue font so that you miss it, it says out here that it's 1.1% as well as 36%. And if you were to expand, now this one worked, and I didn't understand why it did. Um, if you were to expand that, you can see that it's actually there, right there for you to see, but hidden in a way. So what you do is, is that you take the difference 1.1% and divide it by 3% because that's the difference between the placebo and 100% and you come up with a number 36%. So that is how drug company information comes out to you. And imagine if they had put out the ad saying that, hey, take this drug Lipitor, it's, if you took it, <laughs> if 100 people took it, you will save one person from having a heart attack and dying and the rest 99 will get no benefit. And if that had happened, I don't think Lipitor would have made a hundred billion dollars in profit that it did over a period of time. Now, I don't know if any of you are taking the PCSK9 inhibitors and PCSK9 inhibitor is an injection that you take that drops your cholesterol dramatically. So LDL cholesterol will go from over 100 to about 30 milligrams per deciliter. Here is the placebo group right around 90. When they followed these patients for about 1.9 years, what you found that there were more deaths in the group that took the drug compared to the group that did not take it. This was published in American Heart uh, Association Proceedings as one of the landmark trials that benefited the uh, overall U.S. But what I like is to quote to you from John Abrahamson saying that dying with corrected cholesterol is not really a successful outcome. <laughs> so I want to tell you that I we didn't have time to get into the side effects of statins, but the side effect of statins relate to every single function of what the LDL molecule does. You would get myopathy, you are at greater risk of infections, you are at greater risk of in, uh, malignancy, you can get cognitive decline, and you can, the men and women can get erectile dysfunction. So, uh, I guess I said that a little wrong. Um, <laughs> So a low carb, high fat diet does improve your cholesterol quality. So when you come to our office, we are always talking about cholesterol quality, not about how high the cholesterol is, because it'll increase your LDL, but it'll make it the good kind, the kind that is fluffy and not the one that is sticky. It'll drop your triglycerides, it'll increase your HDL. In addition, here is a partial list of things that it does. I'm good, Georgie. It drops your insulin, it drops your hemoglobin A1C, it drops your inflammation markers as we talked about, and a side effect of that is that you also lose weight. So I'm surprised, I guess I must have been a little too excited and I spoke a little too fast. I have time. So what I see out here is that when you come to our office, it's a multifunctional approach and I have several YouTube videos about this so you don't have to come to our office to get this information but I think that nutritional change is a key component of anybody's lifestyle and unless you are like one of my friends uh, uh, Paul Keegan out here and you cycle 250 miles per week and you are lean and thin like him you have to have a strategy of intermittent fasting. Because without that, without you burning the, the fat that you have accumulated, without you shrinking your fat cells, you're not going to get into a point of optimal health. And also of really shrinking your fat cells. We are a big promote, uh, proponent of uh, vitamin D or sunshine to get vitamin D because it also sets your circadian rhythm. Um, sunlight helps you sleep better. There is a little known vitamin which is called vitamin K2 that creates the calcium paradox. You don't, the vitamin D doesn't work well without vitamin K2. And so putting all of this together as a cardiologist, you will see that everything that you're doing out here is going to increase or, or reduce your insulin resistance. It's going to reduce your insulin levels. 
But paradoxically, people are going to be scared because it's going to increase your LDL. And increased LDL cholesterol is there, but the quality of cholesterol has improved and high LDL cholesterol is associated with better cognitive skills, better math skills, longer lifespan, and lower infection and cancer risk. And there are multiple studies that address this. And I don't even think that the experts now doubt it very much. So should we treat high LDL cholesterol or celebrate it as long as the quality of cholesterol is good? And like I said, everything we do to treat cholesterol also increases insulin resistance because there are studies that show that when you go on statins, your chances of becoming a diabetic is quite high. And I think that the doctors like Dr. Westman went ahead of me and I'm glad that he put, pointed out, I'm going to be a little bit more stringent about the way I perceive us, is that because of bias, poor science and profit, the physicians have abdicated their clinical responsibility and have become stooges of the heart association and of the big pharma. So um, uh, my wife is sitting there and she's thinking, man, she's going to get sued next day. <laughs> so um, that's all I had. I'd be happy. I think I finished actually ahead of time, which is kind of a rarity for me. <laughs> Um, I'd be happy to yeah, entertain any questions. Thank you, thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I am in like very uh, shallow waters in terms of statins and secondary prevention. Secondary prevention is people who have already had heart disease and they are on statins. Uh, many of my colleagues have warned me not to show my bias to people like you. Um, uh, I think I think that I like to applaud Dr. Westman, Adapt Life Group, Jimmy Moore, I don't think he's here, Amy Berger, because until we become a force, until we become about five to ten, because right now we are less than one percent of the population, until we become a force, cardiologists are not going to change. The only other cardiologist that I know who talks like me is a Seam Malhotra across the pond in London. So I'm. I'm sorry, I don't know anybody in Louisiana who would tell you to do what I'm telling you to do. I apologize. No Thank you. Yes, please. Um, what you just have to be saying about calling the cardiologist and you're 1%, I have a friend in Pennsylvania and his doctor has told him total opposite diet. Where if it has a face and it has a mother who do not eat it, and no avocados, no nuts, no, uh, you know, plant-based um, plant food. No, 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 they have a face or a There is a danger. There is a danger of going solely plant-based food because plants do not have some of the nutrients that we need. Vitamin B12 is lacking. Essential fatty acids like DHA and EPA is lacking. Iron is better absorbed by our body through animal sources than through uh, plant-based sources. So there is a real danger of adopting a purely plant-based diet without supplements. So uh, you were the lady with the gastric sleeve, and I was hoping you would ask me a question. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> my, uh, my name, oh, I guess I stand up. Uh, my name is Rose Duncan. I'm only here because her husband is one of your patients. I was excited to know that you were recommending a keto diet because I searched for a solution for just weight loss. And to know that there was a heart doctor that was backing this diet was huge. And I thought, yay! Sorry. But it's for both of us. <laughs> um, my only question is, are you accepting mutations in the area? Yeah, we are, uh, and, and Georgie and, and Melissa can help you. 
Just a couple of things about acid reef, I mean, sorry, about gastric sleeve and Rue and Y and stuff like that because uh, I was kind of chiming uh, to say that. When you cut out stomach acid, I have an important YouTube video that says why stomach acid is important for you because stomach acid is absolutely crucial and essential at breaking down proteins because without stomach acid, you don't absorb proteins. So anybody with a gastric sleeve, they should eat the protein part of their meal first. The second thing is that you don't absorb calcium well, you don't absorb vitamin B12 well, you don't absorb iron well, so you can get a lot of nutrient deficiencies. So these, especially if you have the Rue and Y, now with gastric sleeve it's a little bit less, uh, but I ask you to go to that resource. Y yes, Amy, go ahead. Hi, um, I have two questions, I'll try to make them quick. The first is, you, are you following Dave Feldman's work? Absolutely, so the big fan. Yeah, the Two very good questions. So, um, Dave Feldman is an engineer, and we should all follow Dave Feldman's work. I think the American Heart Association should give him an honorary chair. Um, because he has done work in terms of defining how dynamic the LDL, the bad cholesterol is. And just like Amy said, and I have seen in it a number of my cycling friends, if I have a cycling friend who is lean, who is cycling like Paul does about 250 miles per week, and who eats a low carb diet, by design, this guy will not have an LDL cholesterol less than 250. But the quality of that cholesterol will be very good because their triglycerides will be low, their HDL will be high. So what really is happening is that they are burning all the fat. Just like uh, Nurse Cindy said, we have only one teaspoon of sugar in our blood. We have, our body likes to keep the levels of fat in the blood very low. So these guys, if you look at the triglyceride levels in different surrogate markers, they have very small amount of fat circulating in their blood because they use it up all. So I am not at this time prepared to say that based on what we know that when the body is homeostatically regulating a molecule based on energy needs that there is any LDL level at which I will say hey this is too high and I'm concerned because I've seen LDL levels of about 400. Now the next question is a little bit more difficult which is people with low cholesterol and I think that depends on their age. If it's a young person with low cholesterol I'm less worried but if it's an older person over 55, 60 years of age and they have low cholesterol then that is cause for concern because I think that there is increased risks of uh, mortality. Many studies have shown that especially if there's a pattern of the cholesterol falling. But it also has to go along with other parameters. Are they inflamed? What is their body weight? What are their triglycerides? And things like that. So I hope that partially addresses Amy's good question. Um, I'll let you cut off when, whenever you want. There's a question up there. Go ahead. So I can speculate, and I, I think you had just gastric sleeve, you didn't have the Rue and Y. Okay. So stomach acid is important for many more things than just digesting protein. There is a condition called SIBO, 
small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So one of the primary defenses our body has because the food that we eat is filled with bacteria. So the food that we eat, the bacteria gets neutralized and killed so that we don't have an overgrowth of bacteria in our intestines. So high levels of bacteria create what is called gut permeability. They cause um, an increased risk of you absorbing whole proteins into your bloodstream. So if you go to a physician now and say, Doc, I think I have my problem because I have a leaky gut, again, they'll roll their eyes and say, stop reading the internet. But it is possible that leaky gut can kill your pancreas because when you have foreign protein enter our bloodstream, our body mounts an inflammatory response. And one of the reasons people have type 1 diabetes or late onset diabetes in a thin person, because if you go to India, where I'm from, majority of the diabetics are thin, they are not overweight. So what that means is that you're destroying your pancreas in an immunologic way, and you may be getting into what is, and, and I'm getting a little bit out of line because there's somebody called Dr. Joseph Kraft, who's looked at insulin response to a glucose challenge. So type 2 diabetics, if you measure their insulin response, their insulin response is very high. It goes up to even about 150 to 200. But when your pancreas is burning out, that's when your insulin response is actually lower than normal. So what I would encourage you to do is to keep on a low carb diet because you may have limited amount of insulin. That will also reduce the possibility of bacterial overgrowth. You may want to look into some experts about stomach acid as to how to increase your stomach acid. And then finally, you should probably get your insulin levels checked with a glucose challenge. So, um, David, go ahead. Just, can we take one last question from David? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, by the way, David is a very important person in my group. He uh, is a community person. He, he helps and supports us. We have the seminar once a month. But without the help of my friends and my colleagues, it's not going to happen. So go ahead, David. David, I just want to make a comment about finding doctors. A lot of times you're not going to be able to find a doctor that's on board. But remember that a doctor is a doctor. You are hiring a doctor. You're 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 hiring a doctor. you are hiring a Amy, do you know about uh, Maria Soros who runs a low carb of physicians? Uh, she's on Twitter someplace. Uh, if you knew, you could tell them. Sorry, maybe it was my mistake. I was touching it. Apologies.